court as soon as people introduce you. What is working on? It's a produced this time. So as just has been said, from 2002 till 2008, I traveled between Amsterdam and Bosnia. I worked closely with the major organizations of survivors, the mothers of the Srebrenica and Zepa Islams, the women of Srebrenica and the women of Bordrinia. They have offices in various towns. When I arrived, it was absolute poverty, and since the offices have improved. In the beginning, they consisted of quite bare living rooms, the walls plastered with images of those who had been killed, and the mighty people who had come to offer condolences and support, like Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Queen Noor, and Ban Ki Moon, which had left also. The many interviews, life stories that came out of my work with the women are published in my book. My major other contact has been with a non-governmental organization, especially the doctor, who is the only medical help that's available in the camps. Let's be fair, the world of the camp is very different from the sophisticated offices of the NGOs of the women I met in Sarajevo. One realizes that the destitute women want to speak to originate small, in a small economically flourishing town where there was a large civil society composed of middle class and small laborers.
This is some music made by Taylor Usage, and it's played every year, and it's the moment we all start to cry. Uh, why? Can you please show the text? It's the number two in the PowerPoint. It's a song sung by a little girl, but it symbolizes a little boy who um, invokes his country that has been destroyed and misses his mother and then talks about his father, Bosnia. And let's remember that Bosnia only exists for some 25 years. So it's all about the independence and he invokes the women I interviewed want to know what happened. That's all they want. They want to know what happened to their husbands, sons, and the men they love. They sent a writ of summons to the Dutch government and to the United Nations. They leveled accusations against the Dutch, who represented the United Nations in the town, and who had promised protection. The population had believed in them. Though they were very well aware that the Dutch soldiers were no match for the heavily armed Serbian forces. In fact, the Dutch army looked on while men and women were separated, and women with small children were evacuated to so called safe territory. Some men were killed under the eyes of Dutch soldiers, but most were massacred at killing sites. The United Nations, which has promised protection and declared that the enclave would be safe, received also the writ of summons. In this case, the lawyers asked for a judicial declaration of the United Nations and the Netherlands of failing to fulfill their obligations to the United Nations Genocide Convention. Convention which obliges countries to assist people in extreme threat. It's all in vain. They have been turned down. And it's not unlikely that the case will end at the European Court of Human Rights, and that has no judiciary power. I have witnessed over the years how sadness has been transformed into to juridical language. The testimonies in the writ of summons are an accusation. And I have always been amazed at how, in the long and open interviews I held, there was so much more than is readable in this writ of summons. We oral historians interpret silences and we search for the hidden story. In the debates and lawsuits that has ensued after the carnage in Bosnia and Kosovo, it has been demonstrated that the international community needs to acknowledge its failure to give a response to the Balkan wars, to many wars, and to take the perspective of the survivors seriously. Going to court was not an obvious solution for the organizations of survivors I was interviewing. When some important spokesman declared loudly that they didn't trust anymore the legal system, but in the end, 6,000 survivors supported the writ of summons. One could argue that the attention is divided now between this nearly hopeless procedure and the International Criminal Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia. The procedure is hopeless because the Dutch and other judiciary systems do not accept this complaint. And the United Nations relied on the road rule of indemnity. While the 1995 Dayton Agreement stopped the bloodshed, it established a system that instituted territorial separation on the basis of ethnicity. At this moment, Srebrenica is located in hostile territory of the Republika Serbska, and those who dare to return have to deal with an administration of an hostile identity. People feel threatened there, while other survivors are too traumatized to return. The establishment of the ICTY has brought some hope, and indeed it was the ICTY that has defined what happened as genocide. The door of international law is now closed, and that fact in itself 
adds to a feeling of being rejected. The legal rebuttal is seen by the organizations of survivors as a failure by the international community to arrest major cri criminals despite Mladic, they called him in the end. It was really a decade later. I am convinced that the language of the law and juridical thinking have hijacked the possibility of the reintegration of feelings of deep traumatization. One might have wondered whether it would have been possible to integrate those feelings. Since the end of the war, the victims have lived in miserable conditions, in deserted schools, in lodgings that were actually refugee camps. While many of them come from families that were part of the relative wells of former Yugoslavia, they are now unable to give their children a decent education. Years of poverty have been psychological and physical strain. Now, most legal discourse and historical discourse try to understand the history of an epoch and its casuality. But the outcome is different. As a historian, I researched the daily life of Srebrenica under siege. Early on, most information came from official reports and from the International Tribunal. The first type of information tended to meet the demands of the official Dutch Commission or commissions of other nations, and the second type meets the demands of the law. Both present a specific image of a town under siege, an image that has been filtered through the lens of knowing that the people would be slaughtered. The common task was to discover who was accountable, but my picture that emerged was not one of the people that were doomed. People living there were not aware they were going to be killed. Another perspective shows a town that was vibrant, full of people who strongly believed they would survive because they were protected by the United Nations. There was a sharp division between population groups with upper class of endogenous inhabitants and masses of newcomers. In the end, of, of course, they were all miserable. It is certainly not a writ of summons alone that has provoked a transformation in attitudes and languages. Many women I interviewed have tested for the ICTY, the International uh, Tribunal for Formal Yugoslavia, and at various local courts. The massive attention given to testimonies there has transformed their story into defense and accusation. Feelings of revenge turn up so easily, but revenge is in opposition to building up a town and a countryside where people can live together again. The outcome of the law shoots should be financial compensation, but we have to keep in mind that money never restores lost social and cultural capital. It does not revalidate the right to exist as a human being which is a crucial factor in being able to go on living more than any judicial uh, act or decision. The way in which the women have been isolated and denied recognition is an expression of the inability of the world to recognize failure and the inability to keep a promise. Many years were lost while the women of Srebrenica were waiting for news and in the end the identification of the bodies has become the good news. At least a decent funeral becomes possible and some closure might be at hand. I want to show you now one moment from Al Jazeera, although it's not very objective broadcast, but it is short and that's why I choose it, of some of the women who speak up about their wish to give a decent funeral. Thank you. 
It's 13 years since the Dutch Union soldiers abandoned what was meant to be the safe haven of Srebrenica. They did nothing as Serb forces entered the town and rounded up the Muslim men and boys, drove them away and murdered them. It was the worst atrocity in Europe since the Second World War. Just outside Srebrenica, there's a memorial for the massacre, and now the families of those whose names are written here are demanding a Dutch court remove the UN's claim of immunity to allow them to sue for damages to hold it responsible for aiding genocide. Marina Suicide shows this section of the memorial well. 22 of her relatives are listed here. Before she left for the Hague and the court hearing, she explained that this was so important. described recognition as a reciprocal relation between subjects in which each sees the other both as its equal and also as a separate from it. This relation is constitutive for subjectivity. One becomes an individual subject only by the virtue of recognizing and being recognized by another subject. Recognition from others is just essential to the development of a sense of self. To buy, be denied recognition, to be misrecognized, is to suffer both a distortion of one's, one's relation to oneself and an injury to one's identity, because it involves reconnection to a society and a world that seems to have been lost. Money does not revalidate the rights to exist as a human being, which is a crucial factor in being able to go to live on. No juridical act or decision does that. Whoever looks at the survivor's wishes or reads the many psychological reports will see that the absolute sense of desire is to return to normal life and to escape the legal and administrative web. The women are extremely poor. Many live still in refugee camps. But money is materialization of the grief which goes far beyond that. They are just not in the mood. One could argue that Srebrenica is only two decades ago, so the pain is still acute. However, sharp feelings of loss were also evident among the Shoah interviews I made years ago. The loss of loved ones is more important than anything else, but poverty adds to misery. To live in a refugee camp, to exist in an unimaginable destitution without any help, is another form of non-recognition. It permeates the whole personality. Everything is experienced with a sense of total loss. And I give many examples of that in my book, like Nazir, who lives in the suburb. I cannot cry, she, help, she says, crying. I think I have reached the end of my life. First, my father's remains were found, then my son's. My husband died, 40. Days had passed after his death when I buried my son. I went with my only child. There was no one to lay him in the grave. Neighbors and people, I don't know, somebody put him in a grave. Other women feel they should have done something at the moment of killing him. It's a recurring theme in oral history that when one of your beloved is killed, you want to do something and very often you can't do anything. That's a marvelous book by Judith Sura, Guatemala are um, widows who all feel ashamed that they couldn't do anything. Sura feels that she should have done something, 
And she tells about this last moment with her husband. She says, I couldn't say anything. I had the feeling I was paralyzed. And I cried rivers of tears. I didn't shriek. I didn't scream. I didn't say they must not take him. I didn't ask why him. Nothing, nothing. I'm not saying now that I have said something. It might have, if I had said something, it might have saved him. But I couldn't help. They just told us to go along. I couldn't do anything, not a thing. And he was so gentle, my husband, worrying all the time. It was hot that day. So hot that I nearly fainted. I felt sick. He held my hand all the time. He kept telling me everything would be all right. His arm on my shoulder was so heavy. I felt it so deep in my body. Heavy, shaky, fear. Fear of what will happen to us. Although he knew everything, was aware of everything, he kept saying everything would be a lot all right. That was five minutes before they separated us. I turned around to see him for the last moment his eyes. And now I can say I looked at that. He was speechless. His eyes were focused at one point. He wasn't saying anything. His jacket was in his hand. And for a moment I thought, he has squeezed it so hard. It screamed in his hands. He said, are you getting crazy? She was grabbed by her hair, thrown in her truck, and deported to her so-called safe area. After all this confusion of not being able to help someone, there's another layer, the feeling of being forsaken by the world in 1995. And even before, in the years, I was under siege. They believed they would be protected, and the process had been made. They thought they would be alive. It took for me a long time to realize that the life stories of survivors of Srebrenica are not only fragmented by the trauma of 1995, but also by the impossibility of telling the story. Because any narrative of the past is interwoven with a vision of the future, there's a lot of confusion. The women do remember a multicultural society the origin came from, and they still think it's important to live together. But it, it failed, that idea. They were raised on a brand of communism that suppressed any expression of cultural difference. But at the same time, they internalized positive feelings towards members of the other ethnic group. Despite the current nationalist myths that the re region has always been rife with warring hostility, even the most illiterate women are able to describe the alliance between nationalism and state politics that was the origin of all this destruction. But the loss of friendship, of friends, mingles with the fundamental loss of trust in the world and the loss of loved ones. The survivors are left with an unsettling grief, mourning, conflicting emotions, with no stable sense of normality to prove a counterbalance. During the interviews, accounts of catastrophes are not immediately understandable. Narratives of trauma are not straightforward referentials. Rather, they are what Cathy Carews calls expressions of a crisis of witnessing. Carews dealt extensively with the ways in which trauma becomes sedimented in language and literature, and she considers any eyewitness account to be rooted in the dislocation of history, which are imperative. Whoever has interviewed trauma cases knows that chronology fails, lapses occur, and confusion is normal. Talking about trauma often means reliving it in all its pain, difficulty, fear, confusion, and shame. The American psychiatrist, Dory Lamp, I work a lot with and who is a very close friend, wrote, I would propose there is a need for a tremendous libidinal, libidinal investment in those interview situations. There is so much destruction recounted, so much death, so much loss, so much helplessness, 
that there has to be an abundance of holding and of emotional investment in the encounter. Which means there needs to be absolute freedom of speech. Patience is obligatory. Answers are never given. But the desire to answer leads to the beginning of a new story. Because one memory brings forth a new memory. The narratives are often unaware of how much they have to tell. There is an emotional dilemma between the two of us who sit together, having committed themselves to the story. It is a difficult process of remembering. The use of existing narration, genres, is a way to escape the personal memory. And collective memories are redundant. This complicates any understanding of what is being told. The interviewer has to continually question whether the story is indeed personal or if the language is coming from others. Now, by narrowing down that the survivors' desires to material compensation and juridical procedures, the survivors' life stories are also reduced to the demands, format, and language of the law. In preparation for the proceedings and in court, Exact information is required, yet the victim struggles with something incomprehensible, something beyond any traditional concept of history. The significance of remembered stories lies not in absolute truths, but in how one remembers, how one gives meaning, and the representation of events. Stories do not exist until they are told, and an adequate history cannot be written without including the victim's suffering and the survivor's memories. Therefore, we should not dismiss them as constructions that lack factual authority, but rather regard them as being ontological authentic. The genocide of Srebrenica Potosari was a cons conscious creation of chaos, through which the Serbs managed to dominate thousands of people. I want to think about that chaos. It was unlike other stories of mass killing, such as the Holocaust, where those who survived talk about organization as part of the structure of domination. During the Srebrenica genocide, thousands of babies, children, sick, and old were herded into the compound of Putuchari, without sanitation, without food. During three days of aggression, over 30,000 people faced physical crime, killing, beating, rape, atrocities. I don't want to talk about it. They faced psychological torture. They did not know, know they were going to be killed. And they did not know where their men were in the end. They were scared because of the situation in which one could only be scared. Remembering that situation seems to be impossible. The people have narrated to me about it, mostly in broken stories. There's hardly been a clear historical discourse, and the events in Potashari were clearly not integrated in a personal life story. The events stood apart and were at the same time part of a more general confusion in memory. The trauma was the last element in a problematic interplay between not being able to remember and not wanting to remember. From my interviews, I have concluded that the main problem is not how memories are constructed versus a so-called reality. The main problem is what, not can, what cannot be remembered and put into words. To begin with, the women I have interviewed were reluctant to talk about the atrocities and the pain they had gone through. At a deeper level, the survivors either did not wish to remember or more frequently, certain episodes were too difficult to recall in the light of their present lives. I'm not referring to the traumatic episodes, but to their past peaceful coexistence with those who had eventually betrayed them. The past can hardly be understood now. The pre-betrayal they were part of, the participation of friends and neighbors and loved ones in murder and genocide also prevents them from developing any vision of the future, for such a vision can only be based on feelings about what was perceived as good. Uh, last week I listened to a uh, very interesting paper.
Peter van Omar Bartel about a town in Romania. And he stressed again how such micro histories of a, a specific place and of a specific can, can give you a lot of insight into um, those interactions between ethnicities, groups, or people who turn out to be hostile to each other. Um, the book is still being written. Over the, voices, over the decades, voices of victims have become an accepted and essential source of the Holocaust historiography. But only after fierce historical debate. It's not yet the case with Srebrenica. The stories told to me, fragmented and chaotic, reveal what is not known and not presented by official reports committed by the various states that were involved. The stories are told by people who are confused about the disintegration of former Yugoslavia and the ways various identities have, entities have become enemies after many years of what was called by the communist unity. In the interviews I have conducted, memories often manifested themselves in bitterness and angry accusations of betrayal by the Dutch army in particular. The women I have spoken to recount the arrival of the Serb soldiers, this disruption of all good relations at the mass market. They also describe how they try and try again to give meaning to what happened to them. How they have tried to resume their lives, how they have attempted to incorporate experiences. These are traumatic fragments that reflect the women's truths about their subjective experience. The genocide, as I said, was chaos and blood everywhere. There was a horrible stench. Men were reported to be murdered, but on the spot, women and girls were raped. We know now that 731 children are missing, and that more than 5% of the victims were under the age of 15. Thousands of women and children needed to be evacuated without too much protest, and without too much questioning about where the men were. It had to look like a clean and smooth operation. It was not. The women I have interviewed are reluctant to talk about the atrocities they witnessed and the pain they have gone to. The chaos of that time has become a chaos in their head, a memory that would let best be muted. Silence is everywhere, and silence yields many meetings. How can a survivor find words for horror? The horror that has unfolded before her eyes. Is it not better to be silent as the task of remembering and speaking is so horrendous? In the end, the question is there who is good, who can be trusted? There are too many chaotic memories. Maybe this is what afflicts most of the women. Still, years are going by, and some know that the insanity of hatred has to stop. Of course, they have felt initially confused and have hated, but they also know that hatred is not the solution. The, charita charitable, sorry, the charitableness ha that has come slowly is astounding, given the fact that all of them underwent the same fate. I would argue that when emptiness replaces memory, connectedness, context, and a place in the society, where there is no positive memory or positive future, it can be better to forget. Remembering the past requires the survivor to explore positive feelings that are bound to resurface. Feelings that disrupt the negative paradigm and might prompt questions about the need to think about the past of friendship and love. One woman who lost 22 members of her family, it's not only her, including her husband and three sons, managed to tell me about all those positive feelings she had towards her former Serbian friend. While she spoke, the pain was clearly visible in her face. And she said, I dreamed about her. And I was amazed to hear that her sons had served in the army, a special unit. And when I returned to my village and went to her mother's house, she wanted to embrace me, to kiss me. But I told her, we are not what we were before. She started to cry and told me that her sons had not killed my son, but I told her they didn't do anything to save him either. 
I write history based on testimonies about the past. History presumes a kind of chronology which is absent in stories I can present to you. François Davon and Jean-Marc Scaudillier described in History Beyond Trauma how in their practice as psychoanalysts, search for times is there when the time stands still. Stories begin with the moment of trauma, and there does not seem to be time since that moment. According to them, madness is rooted in instability to make things audible. Madness makes words words unnameable. Survivors are not mad, mad, but they have something to convey. Survivors can clash when they appear in court. Survivors are looking for different truths, one that has been denied. Yet they often assume that court proceedings will help them to find it. Answer to the many questions that haunt them by the words, search for Jesus, justice and truth, are more important to them than material compensation. An example is in the testimony of Kada Hotchik in the Orange case. Orange is one of the not so pleasant Bosnian uh, bar lords in Srebrenica. She clearly wanted to tell about a stream of refugees she had seen. It was a massacre. Suddenly, a neighbor turned, had turned against a neighbor, and there were, was an unprecedented violence. The refugees from the fell betrayed by friends, and she wanted to explain what had happened. The judge, however, was not interested in how the local population of Srebrenica had raided the areas and the was, he was only interested in the raids on the area surrounding the town. The accused of that trial was supposed to be the leader of those raids. The court wanted details, but the Gala Hotage mind was focused on something else. The result of that court proceeding is chaos. Her story does not know any chronology. It flashes before her eyes. She wanted to tell her, she wanted to tell everything at the same time, and she wanted to excuse. I want to conclude by saying that if legal language and the demands of law become the dominant narrative for framing eyewitness accounts of genocide, we risk to erase a representation of how deeply lives have been disrupted. We erase fragmentation, silences and dislocations by not allowing the full truth of the stories in their layered and unfinished forms by dismissing them as outbursts of emotion deny their mediated authenticity and the way they might reconfigure or even remake their world for those who have lost their place in it. In turn, we do as historians dislocate the meaning and the place assigned to an event. In this entwinement between the legal truths and the victims need to speak out, material compensation is merely one of the many ways to reclaim a place in the world. To tell and speak are at least as important as other agendas, <coughs> such as depolarizing education systems, promoting tolerance, strengthening independent media, challenging dominant narratives, national narratives, privileging of other voices, institution of truth and reconciliation commissions, finding a place for mourning, and finally, the prosecution of criminals. International institutions have made the last of these the most visible. The institutionalization of pain is not the way to express anger and hope. It's not the way to help victims to overcome the lack of context.